Have you ever wondered which country in Europe has the highest taxation? Well, wonder no more, because I'm not going to leave you without a doubt any longer. That country is none other than Denmark. And take note, because Denmark is not only the most heavily taxed country in Europe, it is also the second highest tax country in the world. To give you an idea, some taxes, such as income tax, have rates that exceed 55.9%. Or to put it into perspective, Danish workers pay up to three times more tax on their salaries than workers in countries such as Estonia or Lithuania. As if that were not enough, other taxes such as capital gains tax, which, for those who don't know, is the tax paid when receiving dividends or selling shares of a company, for example, can reach up to 42% which is practically double what is paid in countries that are hardly likely to be mistaken as being ultra-capitalist, such as Spain. Although, let's stop for just a moment, because now that I've mentioned Spain, this is where the most interesting thing of all appears. According to popular convention, or at least according to what most economists tend to say, a country with taxes as high as Denmark would inevitably be doomed to failure. It would be a country incapable of economic prosperity and certainly doomed to ruin, right? Well, maybe not. I want you to take a look at this graph. What you see on the screen is the GDP per capita adjusted for price differences between Denmark and Spain. As you can see, Danish production has not stopped growing at almost any time in the last 30 years. What's more, unlike the vast majority of countries in the world, Denmark has managed to grow its economy even during the worst phases of the coronavirus crisis. And keep in mind, it's not just about economic growth. If we omit microstates such as Monaco and Liechtenstein, Denmark is currently the fifth richest economy in Europe after Ireland, Switzerland, Luxembourg and Norway. Is Denmark a total exception as far as tax theory is concerned? It's a country with a lot of taxes, but at the same time, it's very wealthy. And what does all this have to do with Spain? Well, let's go back to that graph from before. The blue line that has just appeared on the graph is the line that represents the GDP per capita that Spaniards have. Unlike Denmark, Spain is a country that had great difficulty recovering from the 2008 financial crisis. Its rickety growth has also been doped by a lot of public debt and, to top it all off, it has been the slowest country in the OECD to recover from the coronavirus crisis. In addition, it's not just that Spain has taken a long time to recover, it's that even two years after the pandemic, it has only just managed to reach its pre-crisis GDP levels. That is to say, recovered if you can say that, which kind of can't. At this point, many of you might be wondering, what about taxes in Spain? Does Spain also have very high taxes? Is this an example of a country that does comply with the rule that high taxes equals low wealth? Well, not exactly. It is true that Spain is not an outstanding country in the matter, much less a quasi-tax haven. But if we take a look at that indicator that so many economists use as a guide, the tax burden, the truth is that Spain is the opposite of Denmark. It is one of the countries that collects the least taxes in proportion to GDP of the entire European Union. To give you an idea, for every 100 euros of GDP that a Spaniard produces, on average, only 37 euros is collected in taxes. By way of comparison, in countries such as Germany and Sweden, this figure reaches 42 and 43 euros respectively. And returning to the case of Denmark, it even exceeds 47 euros. In other words, Danish citizens pay 27% more taxes than Spaniards, and yet they're much richer. So with all this in mind, I think the question we need to ask is pretty clear. Why do taxes in Denmark not seem to affect the country's economic performance? Why do countries with relatively low tax pressures such as Spain fail to prosper? Is the Danish case irrefutable proof that taxes need not harm economic activity? Well, today on Visual Economic, we're going to answer all of these questions. So let's Let's get cracking. If there is one thing that most economists, politicians, and in general, anyone interested in the social sciences agrees on, it's that for an economy to grow, the most important thing is for citizens to be able to find productive work. The thing that is in order to get more people to work, it is also necessary for someone to organize them and make them more productive. In other words, you need companies to invest in machinery and new ideas and development projects, and above all, to bear the risk that these business projects could go wrong. Now, what does all that have to do with taxes? In short, according to traditional theory, the more you facilitate the creation of companies and the easier it is to hire staff, the better the economy will be. If you tax too much, you risk companies earning less, workers having less incentive to work, and ultimately, the economy ends up stagnating. However, something that is not often mentioned is that in reality, not all taxes are the same, nor do they affect the economy in the same way. Here's an example. Imagine two countries, the blue country and the red country. 
In the blue country, there is a single 50% tax levied on wages. However, in the red country, a 50% tax is also charged, but only and exclusively when a worker spends his or her money. Note that wherever a worker lives, if he or she receives a salary of 100 euros, say, and spends that entire salary, the worker will pay the same taxes in each country. So you could say that there is no difference between these two tax systems, right? However, if instead of spending the money, the worker decides to use their salary to invest in the company, what will happen is that in the blue country, the worker will only have 50 euros available, while in the red country, up to 100% of the worker's income would be available. That is, 100 euros. In other words, the tax that affects consumption and not wages allows the citizens of the red country to devote twice as much money to creating new businesses. In that case, the consumption tax would be better for growing the economy for two main reasons. Firstly, because at the end of the month, the worker will receive more money in his or her bank account. And if a person receives more money, but is also free to decide what to do with it, then that person will certainly have more incentive to work. And secondly, because by having more resources to invest in companies and new projects, there will be more companies. These companies will hire more workers, they will innovate more, and over time, they will make the economy prosper more. So as you can see, not all taxes are the same, nor do they affect the economy in the same way. Be that as it may, we are now going to look at more concrete data. We're going to look and compare the real taxes in Denmark with the taxes in Spain. Will they be the same or will the differences such as those we have seen in our hypothetical example? Let's find out. Question of costs. Imagine you want to open an IT company where 10 programmers will work. You have calculated that each worker you hire will generate around 5,000 euros. So you decide to spend 4,500 euros to hire them. Knowing this, now comes the key question. What differences would there be between hiring workers in Denmark and hiring them in Spain? Well, in Spain, the company would have to pay taxes for common contingencies, unemployment contributions, accident and illness contributions, an insurance for the wage guarantee fund, and another for the professional training of the unemployed. These are the so-called social contributions. But that's not the end of it. After all this, the worker will also have to pay for more common contingencies, unemployment insurance, professional training, and finally, income tax. In the end, after the company has paid out 4,500 euros per employee, the employee would only receive 2,540 euros and 51 cents in his or her bank account. Account. But what happens when we make the same calculation for Denmark? Well, in this case, the company will have to pay 153 euros of social contributions. Later, the worker will have to pay the national personal income tax, the municipal income tax, and finally, some other minor taxes. Well, taking everything into account, the Danish worker would receive 2,870 euros and 97 cents in hand at the end of the month. That is, with the same hiring cost for the company, the Danish worker would receive 3,965 euros and 49 cents more in his or her account each year year than the Spanish worker. As you can see, the Danish system seems to match much more closely to a red country model where there is less taxation on wages, while the Spanish one looks more like a blue country model. But wait a minute, because we're not actually done yet. Let's imagine that the Spanish programmers are very stubborn and insist on charging the same as Danish programmers. In that case, the Spanish company would have to increase its recruitment cost and pay much more for them. The question is exactly how much money would a Spanish company have to pay for its employee to be paid the same as a Danish worker? Well, again, we make the same calculations as before and observe that to pay the same net salary in Spain, the company would have to pay 5,256 euros each month, 756 euros more than the Danish company. In view of all this, let's just recap for one quick moment. We have said that we would hire 10 workers and we have seen how the tax burden per worker in Spain seems somewhat higher than in Denmark. In total, if we add and multiply, it turns out that setting up the same company in Spain costs 90,720 euros more each year year than it would in Denmark. And yes, before you say it, I know that the cost of living in both countries is different, but even if we adjust the percentage of taxes to the average salary in each country, the result is that in Spain, you pay 11% more taxes than you do in Denmark. Surprised? Well, hold on to your chair because there's still more. Another of the most outstanding characteristics of Denmark is that hiring practices are some of the most relaxed in the world. You could say that in a way, both employer and employee have a lot of leeway to decide all of the details of the contract that is eventually signed. 
things like the minimum wage, the minimum duration of a contract, the type of contract that must be indefinite, and severance pay are practically non-existent. This actually means that in terms of bureaucratic costs, hiring is still much cheaper. To give you an idea, in Spain alone, companies tend to spend around a billion euros each year on laying off workers they no longer need, which, if you think about it, is something like another hidden tax, or at least another additional cost to hiring that would be equivalent to about 540 euros per year per permanent worker in Spain. Tax, by the way, that companies usually pay right in their worst moments, which is when they are forced to lay people off, which leads to many other problems that we will talk about at length in an upcoming video here on Visual Economic. So don't forget to subscribe to the channel and hit the little bell button down there to keep abreast of all of our news. The important issue is that while hiring in Denmark is affordable and flexible, in Spain there are non-stop costs and bureaucracy, which as we have explained in the example of the red and blue country that we saw at the beginning, leads to fewer companies, fewer companies hiring and workers generating less savings and less capacity to invest. Once again, not all taxes are created equal and for example, making it easier to hire workers is perhaps what explains news stories like this one. Denmark alert. 32,000 workers required. 1,000 jobs offered per day. The unemployment rate in Denmark is at historic lows. 3.3% of unemployed representing 140,000 people in a country of 3.6 million people of working age. Now then, if it's so cheap to hire workers in Denmark, how do you explain that at the end of the day, its level of taxes on GDP is the highest in Europe? Where does the Danish government get the money if not from higher taxes on labor? Well, let's find out. The Danish ecosystem. As we have said, Denmark is very much like a red country, a country with reasonable taxes on hiring, but with very high taxes on consumption. In particular, with a flat 25% VAT rate, the Danish consumption tax is amongst the highest in Europe. Going back to our comparison, the effective VAT rate in Spain is 15.6%, much, much lower. If Spain had the same VAT rate as Denmark, this alone would increase its annual revenue by nearly four percentage points of GDP. At this point, it is worth mentioning that if there is a very high VAT, then both rich and poor have to pay the same percentage. VAT is a tax that does little to redistribute wealth. That is, when you go to the store to buy, you pay the same percentage of tax regardless of your purchasing power. This has led many politicians to interpret raising VAT as an attack on the redistribution of wealth. Now, the main argument against this way of thinking is that, in reality, it's not always necessary to make taxes progressive, not even with the intention of distributing wealth. For example, an alternative model would be to charge the same percentage of taxes to everyone, but when that money is collected, spend it exclusively or mostly on those with lower incomes. Does this seem difficult to implement, and do you think that a model with high consumption taxes would inevitably lead to enormous inequality? Maybe? Well, if you do, pay attention to this news story. Paradise of the middle class. Denmark, the country where inequality hardly exists. Most Danes belong to the middle class and only a very small portion to the economic elite. Denmark is such a high and equal income country that only 1.3 average salaries are needed to reach the highest marginal tax rate. This also explains how, although Danish workers do not pay a higher percentage of taxes through their salaries, as they end up having higher and equal wages in the end, this results in higher tax revenues. Think about it. In Spain, whoever earns an average salary is already among the 25% of employees with the highest salaries in that country. And this means that in the vast majority of workers, they contribute very little to the public coffers. In Spain, it is difficult and expensive to hire staff, which lead to fewer companies, lower salaries, and as a result, little revenue collection. As if there were not enough, we can still find more factors that explain why Denmark is so rich despite its high yet efficient taxes. For example, its education system is ranked in the top 18. It is not in the best position, but it is better than the 25th position of the United States or Italy's 38th position. And if you're wondering why we haven't mentioned Spain's education system in these rankings, it's because they were disqualified for cheating in the report. And no, that's not a joke. And this brings us to another point in Denmark's favour. Denmark is the least corrupt country in the world, according to international transparency. And this inevitably means more legal certainties, less crony capitalism, better market competition, and less of a shadow economy. But what about corporate taxes? <laughs> Well, in this case, they are not particularly restrictive either. They have a corporate tax rate of 22%, which is one of the lowest in Europe. They have no wealth tax, and there is a long series of tax deductions to encourage reinvestment of capital in small companies or in research and development. Although it's true that they also have the highest tax on dividends and capital gains in Europe, it must be said. But the point is that they try not to punish production or make it more expensive. In any case, does this mean that the Danish model is perfect or that we advocate that it should be the benchmark? No, not at all. But it does make it clear that punishing production is usually not a good idea. We can also draw some lessons from the Danish case. 
Firstly, if we want to analyze a country's taxes, it is better to analyze how these taxes are focused and not so much what their percentage of collection is. That is, if taxation is focused on penalizing consumption, but an exchange leaves freedom for investment, the creation of companies and the hiring of workers, then these taxes are probably not very harmful and will allow the economy to develop. The second lesson is that taxes are not the whole picture. A regulation that gives flexibility to contracts can be a thousand times better than a very strict regulation, even if there are low taxes. And the third lesson, that even if you want to redistribute from the rich to the poor, it is probably better to redistribute wealth through public spending focused on lower incomes and not through very high taxes on hiring, which in the end is nothing more than punishing job creation. So at this point, all over to you. What do you think of the Danish tax model? What tax settings could you have in your country? Can you think of any other reason for Denmark's success besides the ones mentioned in this video? You can leave us your answers in the comments below. And remember that you can highlight your contributions with the thank you button and that by doing so, you can also financially support the independent media that is all of us here at Visual Economic. If you like this video, like it so we know and activate the little bell button down there so you don't miss any of our upcoming videos. All the best and I'll see you next time.